Welcome to Southgate Today. My name is Tannis, and it's great to have you with us. If you watched the Super Bowl last week, let us know, did your team win? If you're joining us for the first time, say hello in the comments. We want to say hi and get connected with you. Be sure to follow our social accounts and check out our kids' content if you are a parent. We have that all ready to go Sundays at 7 a.m. Each week, we come together to learn and look at the Bible, spend some time in worship, and uh, find some things that will help us grow in our faith. So we are going to do that today. We're in week three of our teaching, God Talk, and we hope that you enjoy this song coming up. Thanks for joining us today. We're just gonna pray together before we get started in a time of worship. So would you join me? God, thank you uh, once again for this time together and just um, the comfort that you bring us, Lord, and knowing that we can claim victory in you because you have chosen each one of us, God, to be your sons and daughters. And um, would we just find refuge in that, Lord, and um, just be able to press into that in times that are difficult, Lord, and be able to rejoice in it um, when we have joyful moments, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Take the broken 
I hope that time of worship was powerful for you and helped you connect with God. Another way that you can worship is through giving. And um, it is a way to give back to God, to say thank you for what he has done in your life. This month, we are doing an Inspire Give. And so all of these funds this month are going to our missionaries. And we're going to let you know at the end of February where that went and how much we were able to raise. So thank you for being part of that. Be sure to sign up for our weekly emails this month. We are highlighting our different missionaries and organizations that we support, not just financially, but also with our prayers. Um, this Sunday, we're talking about why we should pray for others. So this is a perfect opportunity to jump on board with that. And so before we get started, let's pray together. God, we thank you um, for who you are and for calling us to pray for others so they can be encouraged, so that we can be encouraged, and so that your kingdom can come here and now. Be with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. When we talk with God, we learn his ways and enjoy his company. We walk with him through the mountains and the valleys of life, always trusting that he'll lead us in the best way possible. As we do, he reproduces his life in us, helping us to live out his character and filling us with his joy. Is that what you desire? Wouldn't you like to hear the Father say to you, my child, I love you and have everything under control. I'm going to guide you through each difficulty. I will strengthen and empower you through every circumstance. All right, so we are on week three of our series, God Talk. And uh, last week we looked at the Lord's Prayer and how we should, maybe a formula for praying and, and communicating with God and having this conversation. And let me just ask you, what is your prayer life like? How are you doing in this area of your walk with God? I, I, I saw this cartoon uh, earlier this week, and, and it goes like this. You can kind of read this here. I mean, does this describe your prayer life? Is it just like around the table as you say grace? And is it I, I, like, what does that look like in your life? Or, or you, ever, you ever go to someone and you told them you were going to pray for them? And then, uh, and I know it's been a while since we've been in church together, but it's like you, you told Bob last week you you're going to pray for him. And then, and, then, and then this week you see Bob and you're like, oh man, I said I was going to pray for him. And then you're like, God, please help Bob. Amen. And then you go to Bob and you shake his hand. And you're like, I've been praying for you, brother. Right? Like, what is your prayer life like? Are you actually praying for people? And really, why, why do we pray for other people? What, what is the point to pray for other people? I mean, God talk is ultimately about our intimate relationship with the Father. Communicating with him back and forth, ha having a conversation with him, bringing our requests, listening to him. So why would we bring other people's requests? Why, why wouldn't they just do that themselves? Why do we need to petition on behalf of someone else with God? Why would he give you a burden to pray for someone else? I mean, what is the point of that? In fact, we find this in James 5.16. It reads like this, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And so there is a reason that we pray for other people. And that's kind of what we want to look at here today is praying for others. Why we should pray for other people. What is the point of that? And there are some key reasons that we pray for other brothers and sisters, even people who don't know Jesus. There's reasons why we pray for people. And we're going to highlight that here today. The first reason is this, that we look beyond ourselves. I mean, it's one thing to bring all kinds of requests or our list of things that we want prayer for and whatever that may con con concern in, in your life, but it, it, it takes us beyond ourselves, And that's really the nature of God. God is an outward focused being. He's, he, he's, he's full of unconditional love. He gives it away. It's always outward focused, always seeking our good. And so as we grow in character towards who God is, and as we continue to, to grow closer to him, we are supposed to be compassionately outward focused in his name. 
In fact, you find this in John 13, 35. It reads like this. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And in this walk, this journey through life in the valleys and the mountaintops, I mean, this road that we walk through life, it was never meant to do alone. It was never meant to go it alone in your faith walk. We need one another to grow in our relationships, to, to love each other, to sharpen each other, to pray for one another, to, to intercede for others, to help us move beyond our own needs to concerning other people's physical and spiritual and emotional and mental, their, their, their needs and lifting them up, interceding on behalf of other people. It's not just for their benefit, it's for ours. So we can grow in God's likeness, so we can be outward focused, and it's just not always about us. And so that's, that's the first point here, right? Looking beyond ourselves. Number two is this, caring for the worldwide church family. This is, this is vitally, vitally important. I mean, is it just me or when the first time you left your child, if you have a child, you left them with a babysitter and uh, you, you maybe went on a date with your spouse. And, and I remember when this was us, we, we went on a date and basically the whole time we were out on our date when we left our, our son Brayson uh, with a babysitter, we were just wondering, like, how is he doing? Is it going to be okay? Is, is he hurt himself? Should we call the babysitter and find out what's going on? Because you're not there, and you love them so very much. This was what was going on with Paul when he had left the church in Thessalonica. And uh, he would often think about them, and so he, he penned out a letter to them. He, he wrote them because he knew what they were going through. You see, Christians at the time in Thessalonica, they were getting persecuted. They, they were getting their property taken from them. They were getting beaten. They were getting stoned. They were getting ridiculed. They were, they were even being put to death for what they believed in. And so Paul is, is thinking about them. He wants to encourage them. He wants to check in on them after he's left that area and gone on to the next place. He, he wants to know how they're doing and encourage them as much as he possibly can. And while we look at the church in Thessalonica as, as maybe something that happened so long ago and persecution doesn't happen in our day, did you know that last year the estimate is 260 million Christians were persecuted for their faith, for what they believe? In countries like India and, and Pakistan, in China, in North Korea, and in Iran, in Somalia, I mean, all over the world, people are persecuted, they're jailed, they're, they're killed, they're, they're arrested. I mean, all kinds of things happen to Christians just for what they believe. And Paul encourages the church in Thessalonica, but he also encourages the church now. And this is what he says in 2 Thessalonians 1, 3 to 4. He says, We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love, uh, the love all of you have for one another is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all of the persecution and trials that you are enduring. And then we continue this, in, uh, in 11 and 12, and it reads like this, With this in mind, we constantly pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling, and that by his power he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you, and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. See, when we pray for others around the world, it knits, it knits God's global church together. We encourage other brothers and sisters. We, we lift them up and together as a spiritual family, we come together. It, it unites us into one in the single purpose that we all carry from God and from his son, Jesus. 
and an understanding of bold confidence that people around the world live with as they're persecuted, it gives us courage when we face adversity, when we go through the valleys of life, and when we lift these people up in prayer, our brothers and sisters around the world, it helps us, and, and when we're going through difficult situations, we're reminded, oh yeah, I prayed for that. I prayed for that person who's going through something so very difficult on the other side of the world. Which leads us to point number three here. The, pre- the reason why we got to do this is, is sharing in the joy of an answered request. God wants you to pray for other people and because he wants to share the joy of an answered request. You, you ever been there? When, when you've been praying for, for someone maybe so very long or even just a short bit and you get report back that, that whatever the request was, whatever they had asked for prayer for, whatever that was, got answered. And it's just like, it's an amazing feeling to be a part of that. I, I prayed, I, I'm a part of this. I, I witnessed it. I, I prayed and then it happened and it builds my faith and I, and I get that. In fact, Romans 12, 15, it reads like this. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who who mourn. And so when you do this together and you witness that, it just, it, it, it builds you up. It fills you up out and overflowing. And, and it builds this confidence in your prayer life. When we see God answer prayer on behalf of other people, then when we know, when, when we pray ourselves for requests that we have, we know that he, he, can, he can grant it. He, 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 can, he can follow through with his promises and his word, right? It encourages us. But listen, if you pray, and if you've asked for prayer for something, and, and, and God grants that request, if he, if he blesses you and provides in whatever way you've asked for, would you testify about that? I mean, let other people know, especially the people who you've asked to pray for you. Update them. Give glory to God when he answers a prayer request, right? Yeah, give him glory. Let other people know to build the faith in the community of the church. Which leads me to point number four. Preventing and cleaning our sin. Now, we just did a whole series on forgiveness, right? And, 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 and we understood the importance of forgiving others. But check this out in Matthew 5, 44 to 45. It says this, But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And so it's, it's, this, it's a separation that we feel when, when we are not forgiven. And, and instead of plotting out how to get back at your enemies, what this is saying is, is pray for your enemies. Pray for them, the, the people who, who persecute you or who frustrate you or who have done something to harm you or to hurt you. Pray for those people because then we have the mind of Jesus, right? Instead of plotting against them, we, we, we find out that, that God loves them and that he loves us and that he works to restore and redeem and, and heal and bring together and forgive and pray that they would, they would align with God's will in their life, right? Rather than going against them, that, that they would learn to, to, to understand God's plan and his will for their life. Which leads us to the final point, number five. It reads like this, drawing closer to God. It's so, so important. He, he might burden you with the request. He might give you something that you just can't get out of your mind that you feel so deeply within you as a concern for another person. It, it may be simply just to draw you closer to him, right? That, that might be the only reason. Paul exhibited this, this profound truth as he cared for his son, his spiritual son, really, Timothy, right? who he's mentoring and, and he's building up. And, and, he, and his son in the faith here, he says this in 2 Timothy 1, 2 to 7. To Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience as night and As night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers, recalling your tears. I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I'm reminded 
I, I, I remind you to fan into flames the gift of God, which is in you through the laying of my hands. For the Spirit of God gave us, uh, God gave us, does not make us timid, but gives us power and love and self-discipline. See, Paul understood that God was taking excellent care of Timothy. He was doing things through Timothy. He, he wanted to encourage Timothy. He, he understood that, but his love and concern for, for this young pastor of the Ephesian church drove Paul to his knees to pray for him. And yet, even while he's praying for Timothy to be strengthened, Paul finds strength through his prayer and his concern for Timothy. He drew drew close to God and and, and encouraged him to remain brave as he's waiting for his own execution and his own death. In fact, in the final few sentences in that last letter, he would testify this in 2 Timothy 4.18. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. And so to draw close to God, even praying for someone else, allows our hearts to be strengthened, to understand the relationship that we have. And so we we, we get the reasons of why we need to pray, and we outline them here. Like, we understand why we need to pray, but how do you pray when someone asks you? How do you respond when someone asks you to pray for them, right? Well, well, what are the steps in that? Well, again, Paul does a really good job in the first chapter of Colossians. He he gives this powerful model for intercession, so praying on behalf of other people. He gives us a model and and an idea, a template, and uh, it can be used to lift anyone up to God, whether it's a person halfway across the world or your brother or sister or your mom or dad or your spouse or your kids, right? It's a model that we can use to pray for other people in, in an intercessory kind of way. Paul writes this to the church in, in Coloss. And keep in mind that Paul actually probably never met these people. He, he, never, he never, ma- never was there. And yet, and yet he gives them this outline. He knew what was going on there. He heard that there's some, some messed up kind of teaching that was going on in that church. And, and this is what he does in Colossians 1, 9 to 12. He says this, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. Bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have a great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. And so pulling out of this passage, I mean, we underline for you just just some some, some template here of, of what Paul is teaching us and how to pray. Even if you don't have the specific need of someone, but you feel a burden to pray for them, here's a model you can use to do that, all right? The first thing, an understanding of God's will. We find this in verse 9, to fill you with the knowledge of his will. And so, God, I want to pray for, for I, I want to pray for this individual that your will would be done in their life right? Which leads us to number two here, a worthy walk in verse 10, to live a life worthy of the Lord. And so I'm just praying for them in their, in their walk with you, that they would grow closer to you, that they'd represent you well, that they'd, they would understand your goodness and your grace and your forgiveness and your love, right? That they could walk the straight and narrow. Number three, a fruitful work. Number, verse 10, bearing fruit in every good work that they'd be productive, that they'd, that they'd feel like they have purpose in their life, that, that the things that they put their mind and their heart and their soul into, that they would bear fruit for you and your kingdom and your glory. And number four, 
the knowledge of God. Verse 10, growing in the knowledge of God. And so that they would understand your heart, that you would give them wisdom and clarity in the situation that they find themselves in, that they would have a knowledge of of good and and right and wrong, and, and that they would bear your image in all that they do. And number five, powerful endurance and patience. In verse 11, we see this, so that you may have great endurance and patience, right? That you would, you would be with them, that as they run the marathon of life or the situation they find themselves in, that doesn't seem like it's ever going to end, God, that you would give them strength, that you would give them power and endurance to finish the race well, to, to go to the next chapter of, of whatever that season of life that they're in, and you would give them patience as they deal with this burden that they're facing. And then the final thing he says here. In Colossians, a heart of joyful thanks. In verse 11 and 12, giving joyful thanks to the Father. That they would have joy in, 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 in who you are, God, and, and, and what they do. And they'd find joy in the small things. And they'd give thanks to you, no matter their situation. And when you, when you follow through and, and you live out your promises, God, and, and you bestow your blessing upon them, that they would give you thanks in that situation. See, the Apostle Paul, he doesn't, he doesn't guarantee that every moment of their lives, the people that you're praying for are going to be easy. That's not what he's saying here. He just gives us this template but because it can help us and, and help your loved ones become more and more like Jesus. Growing patience for others, purifying desires, and enduring their trials. You might never know the impact of your prayer life. You might never find the, 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 the outcome of, of the person that you prayed for, especially if they're halfway across the world. You never know the full impact of your prayers, but remember, God is able to do abundantly more beyond anything you ever ask or think according to the power that works within us. And so where do we go from here? A few next steps we wrote down, just very practically. Number one, would you just pick one or two people this week? Maybe, maybe it's a burden that, that God's laid on your heart for. Maybe it's your neighbor or someone who, who, who you haven't seen in a long time, who's part of the family here at Southgate. Maybe it's a parent or a loved one. Pray for a couple people this week, right? Take, take a day, take every day this week. Start your morning, your day off in the middle of the day, right? And, and we've, we've released this prayer patterns uh, kind of idea and challenge to you. And so lift someone up every day this week. Number two, Pray for our missionaries. We're doing these missionary interviews, our, our partners, and, and, and when you see those on a weekly basis, would you, would you be praying for them? Would you lift them up? Would, would, you, would you ask for strength for them and, and encouragement for them in this very, very difficult season that we find ourselves in, right? And number three, actually pray for someone right then and there. Instead of saying, Bob, I'll pray for you, Bob. And, uh, and then forgetting to do it, right? Why, can't, why, why couldn't you just pray in the moment? Pray right then and there. Even if it's not fancy, even if you don't feel like you have the right words, but praying for someone right then and there is powerful, right? And that's how the body, body of Jesus, the body of Christ comes together and builds each other up. And so let me close today in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we, we thank you for this gift not only do we get to communicate with you and, and lift our requests and our, and our needs and, and we, can, we can ask for, for your will to be done in our lives, but we can also do that for others. And that's a huge blessing for us, God. We are, we are asking for a, a rich blessing over our brothers and sisters who are around the world. That 260 million people that, that the, the figures show are persecuted every year. Father, we want to lift them up. You would strengthen them that they'd feel purposeful, God, that you would lift them and encourage them, give them endurance and patience. And God, that your, your, your blessings would, would, would flow and, and, and reign over them. And Father, we're praying for our family, our church family, that you would strengthen us, that you would encourage us. God, lay a burden on, on our hearts and who to lift up to you. Who to, who to pray inter, intercessor, uh, intercessory like to, for other people, God? And, and who is that person that you're laying on our heart? And so, God, we thank you for this gift. We thank you for speaking to us and going before us in all that we do.
We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this week. I'm Kevin, and I just want to take some time to talk a little bit about the sermon and how it can apply to your life this week. And uh, one of the things that we like to do during this time is ask a question, a question that you can talk about with your family, maybe with some friends that are also tuning in. Um, so the question that I've got for you this week is, what effect does praying for someone have on them? What, what effect does it have on them? What effect does it have on you? Uh, we often think that, that praying for someone is all about offloading the responsibility to God. Once, once I've prayed for someone, there, now it's up to God. Um, but what kind of an effect does praying for someone have on you and have on that other person? Talk about that with some friends, some family, some other people that are tuning into the teaching. And I, I, I want to I challenge you a little bit this week. Um, I remember a time where I, I confessed in a small group setting uh, before COVID. We were together in a room and uh, in my small group, I confessed that I was having a difficult time with someone that I, I was I was feeling resentful towards them and someone challenged me they said Kevin why don't you try praying for them and see what happens and I decided to take them up on this challenge I, I prayed for this person that I was feeling resentful towards and I noticed something was happening it wasn't just that that their life was changing but mine was also changing as well my heart was being softened towards them and just this, this past week, we uh, at the Ottawa West Campus have been praying for a family with some health difficulties. And interesting things have happened. It, that's caused people to start making some phone calls to different people and to start encouraging uh, people on their road to recovery. And so when we pray for other people's needs, it also gives us the opportunity to see how God wants us to be a part of that. And so I wanna challenge you this week uh, PB challenged us to pray for some people, and I want to I want to challenge you to pray for two specific people. I want you to I want you to pray for somebody that you're in conflict with, and I want you to pray for somebody who has a need. And I I want you to see what God does not only in their life but also in yours. Maybe God softens your heart a little, or maybe God pushes you to address some of those needs yourself. Thank you so much for joining us, and I hope that you have a fantastic week.